where we've been going or where I've been going over the last several weeks with the story of American history is to try and get at the question of this paradox, the idea in America that um, that equality from the very beginning depended on inequality, That's, that for certain people to have equality, it depended on women and people of color not being equal because only by getting rid of the undesirables, if you will, from society, could you guarantee that everybody else should have, um, should have equality. So, uh, so I've taken that from the beginning, really, I think I started with Shakespeare, from the beginning to uh, the end of or the 1830s, the 1930s, the end of the what, what we're going to know is the end of the depression. It's it, they don't know yet that's going to be that, and the enshrinement in the um, American popular culture of the idea of the individualist in the West, the way that you had had it before the Civil War. Um, in the East in the form of a yeoman farmer. In the West, you got it in the form of this cowboy, this Western individualist. And that shows up as I talked about in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and in Stagecoach. And, and I didn't mention another movie last week, and that was The Women. That was also a very important movie in 1939 because that movie is really the, the reassertion of the role of women as wives and mothers in society. And in that very famous film, Incidentally, written by uh, the 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 wife of Henry Luce that I'm going to talk about um, about today, Claire Booth Luce writes this story, and it's a very traditional story of a wife and mother who is whose marriage is threatened by um, by modern day society and modern day womanhood. So that's another movie that came out in 1939 that kind of hammered on this idea of a certain kind of American. Um, normality, if you will, that it's a sort of heteronormative individualist man surrounded by his loving family headed by his wife uh, and, and the mother of his children. So, um, so that's another movie that went into that. But I left you there and I sort of said, you know, here we have the reassertion of this certain kind of Americanness that, that looks very much like it did before the Civil War. The idea that to be uh, an equal American, you needed to be a white man who had a wife and the mother of his children and small children around him. And that really excluded people who were demanding equal rights based on humanity, if you will. So, um, so I left it there, and you know, it's so interesting to think about what the world would have looked like had we left things there. If if the if the story ended, when the story I started telling, for example, ended in 1865, without us America spreading to the west of the Mississippi, um, the American people at that moment spreading west of the Mississippi, the world would have looked very different. And if the world had ended with, as I say, that mule going being washed downstream with its twelve thousand dollars on its back at, after the end of the first uh, cattle cattle drive, the world would have looked very different. And it's interesting to think about what America would look like now had, in fact, the world stopped in 1839. But of course, the world did not stop in 1839. And this whole reassertion of the idea of the American individualist in 39 is going to be blown to smithereens in December of 1941. Because in December of 1941, of course, um, Americans were looking at a world that had um, that was very different, a government that was very different than it had been in 1932, for example, when uh, 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 FDR, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt had been elected. And what FDR and his people had done while they were in power is they had created a new kind of activist government to look very much like the sort of thing that Teddy Roosevelt and before him and um, Abraham Lincoln had envisioned. And that's a government that really worked for, to create equality of opportunity for people at the bottom. But as I say, um, FDR had created this, this government that really did protect the idea of that American individualist. As I say, the, the New Deal was a phenomenal change in American government, but it really did privilege uh, white men over people of color and over women. So that exchange that for the, of the 1920s government for the one of the New Deal is very important because among other things, what the, what, um, the new activist government does is it provides jobs for more than eight and a half million people it puts up more than 65, uh, 650,000 miles of new highways. 
It builds or repairs more than 120,000 bridges. One of the reasons bridges are now in such disrepair is that many of them have not been adequately rebuilt since that initial putting up. They put up more than 125,000 buildings. They brought electricity to more than 90% of Americans in the rural areas that previously had not been served. They regulated the stock market. They regulated the financial markets. Um, they also provided unemployment and old age insurance. This is where we get social security. And I just have to put in a plug here for Frances Perkins, who was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's secretary of uh, labor, who insisted on uh, social security. And I feel like she doesn't really get her due. Uh, she, she is, of course, responsible for this enormous change in our lives. And most people have never even heard of her. She is <clears throat> from Maine. Anyway. Um, was, obviously. Uh, I live sometimes in the past. Anyway, um, they also gave workers real borrowing power against, uh, to real bargaining power to work against, not to work against, but to, to be able to take a stand against employers, which had been completely wiped out in the 1920s. So that's what this looked like in 1941. And then, of course, in December of 1941, the Japanese hit the U.S. naval fleet anchored in Hawaii. And with that, uh, that bombing that sank 18 ships and killed uh, um, uh, about 2,500 Americans, uh, America is thrust into a world war. And the government is going to pour more than um, $296 billion into the war effort over the next four years. In our money today, that's more than $4 trillion. And the this deficit spending, the enormous amount of money that the government is going to pour into that war effort, is going to jumpstart the economy in a way that even the, the New Deal programs could not do. It really turns what was a very sluggish recovering economy into a, a booming economy because suddenly there are well-paying jobs. Um, the in the in order to fight the war the um the government forced industrialists really to engage with workers and to help workers or to be denied contracts so there is this real sudden push and we have this image that, uh, that it was really manufacturers acting on their own out of heroism if you will that enabled us to mobilize the resources we needed to to fight world war ii but, but <clears throat> In fact, there's a terrific book out by a man named Mark R. Wilson, uh, who talks about really the, the U.S. government stepped in and was very hands-on with the, the industries to make them come up to speed and to make them really rejuvenate the American industrial capacity. Um, it's a really ter terrific book that talks, I mean, it's, it's, it's not... It's an academic book. I'm sus I suspect a lot of people wouldn't necessarily want to run out and read it, although anything this guy writes is worth reading. Um, but the point is he makes a pretty definitive case that our vision of industrialists being these sort of lone heroes in this era is just completely wrong. Uh, it's very well, his stuff is incredibly well documented and it's very well done. Anyway, um, what happens with this change is not only the booming of the economy, but the beginnings of what, uh, beginning with the, the um, New Deal legislation, the beginnings of what economists call um, uh, the Great Compression. That is um, income at the top of the, of the economic scale and income at the bottom of the economic scale start to compress. So instead of having the extremes from the 1920s that people had lived under where workers got less and less and people at the top got more and more, we have this compression where the, the income be, and the wealth, which are two different scales, the income and the wealth between people at the top and the people at the bottom begin to compress. And that starts in 1933 and it's going to go through until 1981 which is where I'm going to end today. So what's important about this is I just gave you the economic history back here, but what's really important to me, and I think the most fun about the stuff I'm doing with World War II, although of course World War II itself is a lifetime study, is that when people conceived of this war, when they thought about what was happening, they did not think about great generals or about um, about great heroes in this war. That was kind of the way um, the fascist governments thought about the way they, they, they were fighting the war. But in America, we thought about the average guy, the general infantry, the GI, the normal people, the ordinary people, who the nameless people who left everything behind to march out and stand for democracy against fascism, because nobody ever forgot that that's what this war was about. It was about saving America, sure, but it was about stopping fascists from taking over the world. And the people who stopped that were regular Americans. And you can see this, as I say, from the little G.I. Joe toys right through um, 
right through the the writings of people like Ernie Pyle, if those if anybody who remembers him, somebody I'm sure some of my my listeners here are going to remember Ernie Pyle and his phenomenal phenomenal columns and books and the love he bore for the soldiers with whom he was embedded. And of course, um, I, uh, I won't give you the spoiler here, but if you're interested, it's worth following Ernie Pyle's life and and how he suffered for what he did and how he ended up, um, how his life ended. Um, but anyway, this whole focus on regular people, on individuals, starts to break down racial and gender boundaries very, very quickly. Because with all hands on deck, nobody's really taking note of who's showing up to fight. That is, um, people, immigrant Americans and people who have heritages of, of immigration are showing up to fight in huge numbers, of course, especially Polish people, Italian people, Jewish people, people who are part of, um, of populations that Hitler has overrun, are eager to fight against him. Even if anybody's interested, there's a museum in Las Vegas called the Mob Museum, and they actually have some letters from mob figures who tried were trying to get in the army because they were so furious at what was happening to their people back home. And the idea that mobsters were out there saying, you know, never mind the the business of you know of uh, of of crime, we want to go pick up a gun and fight Hitler. Um, just wonderful stuff. And the Mob Museum for. Um, for this pandemic has put video online and exhibits online. It's a, it's a very cool museum. So you can go check out those videos if you're interested. Um, but uh, so people are really trying to get, to get into the act and to fight. And the same is true of populations in America that have previously been marginalized. So for example, African-Americans turn out to fight, to fight. And those are the numbers we actually have because the army did keep track of African American fighters versus, say, Italian Americans who were self-identified, uh, and you know somebody might might not identify as that, so they couldn't actually keep numbers of that very accurately. But they could keep numbers of um, racial categories like African Americans, who, as I say, turn out to vote. Um, I'm sorry to to fight more than um, more than a million, uh, 1.2 million African Americans fight, and of course Native Americans turn out to fight. And one of the interesting aspects of American history is that Native Americans, since the turn of the 20th century, have fought in higher percentages for their percentage in the population than any other group in American history. So Native Americans always turn out in higher numbers to fight than any other, for the US, the US government than any other group in, um, in American society. People don't always know that, um, and that's uh, obviously significant, uh, and not least for the for World War II, because it's the code talkers who were pioneered in World War One, but who really make a huge difference in the American Pacific, the Atlantic as well, but in the American Pacific and World War II. At the same time, you've got this whole change going on as these men drain out of the country. You've got this whole problem in the fields and the farms, and in people in, in increasing field farms and factories, and people increasingly who had been not really part of that world before the war go into the factories. And this, of course, begins with African Americans who come out of the South and go into urban areas or to the West to work in factories. Um, it also has to do with women suddenly going into the factories. This is where you get the image of Rosie the Riveter, for example. And finally, um, you get, uh, not finally, you get uh, the, the fact there is still a problem in the West with a lack of workers. And so the American government develops the Bracero program in 1942 to go ahead and bring Mexicans back over the border after having expelled them during the Depression to enable them to work in the, in the fields. And they are supposed to have um, financial and legal protections when they come uh, to work as Braceros. And the fact that they that doesn't really play out is going to matter in just a few minutes. Similarly, uh, the Japanese who were interned after Pearl Harbor end up um, uh, being released from work cam from camps, uh, from the internment camps in order to work in the fields. And about 10,000 of those uh, Japanese Americans end up working in the fields. And it's worth remembering, of course, that even though this is the case, this doesn't mean they're treated equally. You know, black soldiers get lower pay, women get lower pay. Obviously, the Japanese who are in uh, who are who are working in the fields after being interned are not being rewarded adequately for what they're doing. And this discrepancy between what they're doing and the language of uh, of what should be equality by 1943 is going to have 
result in a lot of riots across the country. So it starts really in 1943 when um, Hispanics in uh, in Las Vegas, uh, Los Los Angeles, start to, uh, to flout wartime rationing, wartime clothing rationing, and they wear these big suits that they call zoot suits. They have extra fabric on them. And the backlash against the visibility of uh, Latinos in these uh, these neighborhoods means that they white backlash on that and they attack um, these young men who in turn fight back. And these become known as the zoot suit riots, if you've ever known, ever wondered what those were. And then we also have um, uh, this is by 1943. We also have race riots across the country. As the government tries to, under FDR tries to enforce the idea that there sh that that um, positions in factories should be merit based rather than racially based, uh, especially in Detroit, um, uh, the at the Packard Motor Car Company, uh, three African Americans are moved on to a white assembly line, and there are um, riots across Detroit after that. They kill about 34 people, wound more than 500 others, and um, this, this, these riots, these race riots, are, are going to be um, uh, across the country throughout the rest of the war. And then after the war, um, there is this continuing push among previously. Uh, um, subordinate people uh, to demand equality. And, and it's interesting because we're going to focus, and we often focus in America on the Black experience, which of course is the one that, that, um, that we still talk about even to this moment. But one of the first groups to really crack into the legal segregation in America is actually Mexican Americans, and Mexican Americans challenged school seg uh, school seg segregation immediately after World War II, and they win. They win, and they force Governor um, uh, the California Governor Earl Warren to change the laws in California to stop discrimination against Mexican children in or Mexican American children in California schools. And then in um, in uh, uh, 1948, there's another big uh, Supreme Court case called Shelley v. Kramer. And what that does is it actually, the Supreme Court looks at, um, a, at housing restrictions and it says you can't have those under the 14th Amendment. And it actually applies the 14th Amendment to state action. And when that happens, it opens up the whole uh, possibilities of using the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause to stop state discrimination. And that's, of course, going to be huge. All right. so. Um, so the by 1949, the California Supreme Court actually looks at Shelley v. Kramer and it uses that to outlaw um, um, marriage laws that say that it, it, that ban interracial marriage. So you can see a sort of moving here toward the idea of equality through the law. This is also going to set the stage for Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas of 1954. And that I'm going to tell you about in just a little bit. But they're not the only ones who are challenging things. Even during the war, Asian Americans uh, st stand up and they say, let's talk a little bit here about the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, because last we looked, we were on your side. And because Americans are able during this war to distinguish between their Japanese enemies and their Chinese and Filipino allies. In fact, um, in 1943, Congress overturns the Chinese Restriction Act. So you've got this, I say, this, this nibbling away at these racially exclusive laws. And then finally, um, there's this real social push to get rid of um, to get rid of the, the hierarchies that I've talked about, to get rid of this social understanding that it's okay for you know, African Americans or Mexican Americans or Asian Americans to be less equal than white Americans. And you see this in a lot of popular culture. One of my favorite things, and you, I mean, there's all kinds of posters and there's all kinds of radio programs. Uh, so Superman has a whole bunch of radio programs about this. But one of my favorite things is that Frank Sinatra, um, does a, a, a short film that's available on YouTube called, um, I think it's called Our Town. And off the top of my head, I can't remember it right now. But um, but it's Frank Sinatra taking on a gang of boys who are attacking uh, a, a, one of their own for being Jewish, as I recall, maybe being Italian, but I think it's being Jewish. And he, he gives them, he lectures them about how um, you know, Americans are made up of a hundred different kinds of people, but they're all Americans. And it's just a wonderful short film. It's about 20 minutes to say you can find it. 
if you're interested. So um, so there's this real push to say that everybody is an American. And the great image of that, of course, is that very famous poster by Wayne Boring, who was one of the, the illustrators of Superman, who has Superman talking to a bunch of high school kids. And he says, you know, that, that um, that anybody who says, he says that, you know, kids, um, anybody who picks on anyone for their religion or their race or or whatever, um, those are un-American. You call them out because that's un-American uh, tactics. We are Americans, we don't think that way and we don't think that way. And on the heels of all this, scholars begin to look at America and they begin to argue that America is different than anywhere else. Um, and, and, it's funny because, you know, I, I've talked about this before and people think that I am saying this. What I'm doing is I'm describing what scholars did and what Americans did in the immediate aftermath of World War II. And that's they wanted to figure out why America was different. Why hadn't America fallen either communism or to fascism? in the in that immediate period and what they decided was that americans didn't have that problem of either fascism or uh, uh socialism because we were so practical that at the end of the day we had these shared democratic values and that we didn't we weren't susceptible to ideologues and that we shared this great consensus we had this great idea even though we might fight over politics we had this great idea that most of us were part of this tradition that we cared about the individual and we cared about the government um, supporting that individual uh, uh, arranging the government in such a way that that individuals could could have equality of opportunity and so Americans they said uh, had coalesced around this great liberal consensus and what they meant by that was it wasn't fascism and it wasn't communism it was this this idea that the government should protect um, uh, to regulate business and protect a basic social safety net and promote infrastructure. And we all agreed on that. And that was essential enough and widespread enough that the, you can always tell this because the holdout from that was on a radio show um, that, um, that, uh, by Fred Allen, who ridiculed people who didn't think that way. And he ridiculed them with this recalcitrant Southern senator named Senator Claghorn, who like wouldn't drive through the Lincoln Tunnel because Lincoln was, you know, he hated Lincoln and, you know, this sort of old Southern reactionary. And that was so popular that it got turned into Looney Tunes Foghorn Leghorn. That's why we get Foghorn Leghorn is sort of to show just how ridiculous anybody is who doesn't embrace this idea of everybody being in it together. All right, I feel like I should totally quit today with Foghorn Leghorn, um, but I promised you I would go on to 1881. So I'm going to keep on pushing forward here. So I've described this like everybody agrees, right? Well, not everybody, because the people who don't agree are the, the people who loved Herbert Hoover, the people who believe that business should run the country and that this whole newfangled activist government thing is going to destroy American society. Uh, libertarians don't like it. They want government at all. And finally, um, fundamental Christians don't like this idea because uh, the New Deal seems to be replacing religious religious emphases with secular reforms. And these people are going to be led by Robert Taft. Senator Robert Taft of Ohio, and he is William Howard Taft's son. And he's kind of a, a small town, unlike his father, he's kind of like a small town, has a very limited vision of the way the world, the modern world is. But he is enormously important in the Republican Party, not least because even though he is a Senate leader, he is also the guy who holds the purse strings for the Republican National Committee. And that's going to matter a lot. So they think uh, the, the, the Taft Republicans, excuse me, believe that uh, the New Deal is going to be completely overturned because who could possibly like this crap? And the first thing they do after the war is over is they try to gut some of the uh, benefits that uh, that unions have gotten under the New Deal. And this is where we get Taft-Hartley Act. That's Taft-Hartley that, that really claw back some of unions' rights, rights to organize. But they go further than that. They really, really think that they're going to be um, to be put back in, in power in 1948 after the war is over, the midterm elections, and they're going to um, to um, to get rid of the New Deal altogether. And when the the people once again vote for Democrats, they're like, you know, what what the, what just happened here? And I'm sorry, I said that was a midterm election, but of course, 48 was a was a presidential election. Um, and they really this is when we get um, we get. Um, uh, Truman holding up the the newspaper from the Chicago Tribune saying Dewey wins, and that was uh, because the Chicago Tribune was so. Con 
convinced that the Taft people were going to be in power. They actually printed up the news heads headlines before the election was over. And they were wrong. They, and this was new. They just couldn't believe that this was the case. So they come to believe that America is in danger of being overrun by communists because they look at this liberal consensus and they don't see a medium between uh, fascism and communism. Instead, they see communism. And as one Eastern European country after another falls to communism after World War II, they are convinced that America is going to be next. And when uh, when China falls in 49, that's it for them. They just think there, there must be people in America helping this to happen. There must be people in the State Department that are deliberately spreading communism. And you see this uh, in 1950, in February, on February 9th, 1950, when Senator Joe McCarthy, Joseph McCarthy from Wisconsin, a junior senator, stands up in front of a group of women in Wheeling, West Virginia, and he waves an envelope and he says, I have here evidence that there are 205 members of the Communist Party working in the State Department. And he says, the, 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 um, the Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, knows it. Now, McCarthy had nothing of the kind, but it tapped into this fear of communism spreading across the country. And the very next day, of course, there's new headlines everywhere. And the very next day, he telegraphs President Truman, charging him with protecting communists in the government and saying that the Democratic Party was actively working for communism. And government officials are like, let's see some evidence here, dude. There's no evidence of this at all. And M McCarthy never produces any evidence. I mean, that's the beauty of a smear campaign like that is, and, and mind you, we're seeing it right now before an upcoming election, right? The beauty of a smear campaign is that you don't ever have to produce evidence. You just have to stay ahead of the previous accusation because by the time people have fact-checked your past your past accusation, you're on to the next one. And while they're checking that, you're on to the next one. And you never actually have to produce anything. And the person who really pioneers this technique, it's a rhetorical technique in America, is Joe McCarthy. Um, so, um, uh, you know, the 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 McCarthy people think that it, McCarthy is obviously doing this to be reelected in the in the midterm election of 1950, and they're shocked when once again uh, voters leave Democrats in charge of Congress. And so in 1951, we get a really important new book. Um, mind you, it's not a real new book, so I wouldn't rush right out for it, but it's a really important new book because this guy who's straight out of Yale, a guy named William F. Buckley Jr., he's the son of an oil man, he's a devout Catholic. He looks at the fact that Americans continue to elect members of this liberal consensus, you know, either Republicans or Democrats. And, and he says, we got a problem. We got a problem because the whole concept of enlightenment, and mind you, this is an aside by me, the enlightenment on which America is based, is that if you make fact-based arguments, uh, humans will choose the right one. I mean, you get enough people in on the conversation, the, they will move things in the right direction. That's the whole basis of the Enlightenment, that you need to make inquiries, you need to change your position based on facts. And he says, look, you know, we got a problem with this. This isn't right. Because every time we try and make an argument, people keep choosing the New Deal. They keep choosing these new, um, these the this activist government. And so this whole idea of the Enlightenment must be wrong, the idea that you can make fact-based arguments. So we no longer should make try and make, get people to come to us with fact-based arguments to return America to what had happened before or what it looked like before, World War, uh, before the New Deal. Instead, we need to simply accept as a given, non-negotiable, an ideology, and that ideology is that the government must promote individualism, uh, by which he means it cannot get involved in any kind of business regulation or social safety nets, um, and it must promote Christianity. Those two things are inviolable, and that you cannot argue them at all. Those are like the Ten Commandments, and they, they must be the bedrock of what we do to take back America from this liberal consensus. And the book in 1951 was entitled God and Man at Yale, um, The Superstitions of Academic Freedom, and that it was an explicit attack on this principle, and it's itself an example of it. So he cherry picks stuff from his, uh, mind you, Yale University is no bastion of communism in 1951, let me tell you. But he, he cherry picks stuff from his um, 
from his teachers. He attributes terrible motives for the one of my favorites is he basically says they're hiding, you know, questions. I wanted to look at the, the, the questions from a series of exams and they're hiding from me. Well, at least uh, until the 1980s at Ivy League institutions, that you weren't allowed to keep exams because what was happening is they were getting collected in books in fraternities. They weren't called fraternities then. And so they gave a leg up to the men who lived in those fraternities. And it they were, I forget what the of them were, but the point is exams were really, really, really highly gu guarded because of cheating, not because there was some, um, some attempt to keep William F. Buckley Jr. from proving that there was communism. And it was just, everybody knew that, but he doesn't talk about that. He says, they wouldn't let me have it. Therefore it proves they are communists. And I'm paraphrasing that, that's not a quote. So anyway, um, he um, he basically says that the people who oppose are opposed to the New Deal should get rid of that orthodoxy, as he calls it, and replace it with a new orthodoxy that simply takes us back to um, to the world before the New Deal and World War II. Um, this is 1951, and it's uh, it's really an attack in 1951 on the Democrats who in, are in charge of the White House and who have been in charge of this 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 liberal consensus the construction of this liberal consensus since FDR took office in 1932 and the expectation is that a republican is going to take office in 1952 and the strong expectation is that it's going to be Taft Robert Taft and they're going to erase all this so you know, this this world war 2 new dealing is going to be just a flash in the pan and and we're going to get back to real america 1920s america in 1948 i'm sorry 1952 but of course, what happens is that Taft is deeply opposed to America's increasing involvement overseas. He doesn't want to be part of NATO right at a time when NATO forces are trying to hold back um, both uh, uh, Russia and China in um, in the world sphere. And there's a new player in the game, and that's Dwight Eisenhower, who is determined not to let communism take over the world the way fascism looked like it was going to. People forget he fought fascism and communism. They see him largely as an anti-communist fighter. He was also an anti-fascist fighter, obviously, during the war. But Eisenhower goes to Taft, and he says, listen, I need to hear that you're going to back NATO, because if you're not going to back NATO, I'm going to run for office. And Taft is like, no, we're pulling out. We're, we're, I want nothing to do with it. I'm in charge of the Republican Party. We're going back to the way things were in 1920, the 1920s. And Eisenhower says, okay, then I'm running for president. And Taft gets knocked out of the, um, the running for the Republican National Convention in 1952. And if anybody's interested, I know this is in the weeds, but there is footage from the 1952 Republican National Convention on YouTube. And you can see uh, first of all, how boring things were. And it's going to be Eisenhower's campaign that is going to really tart up, if you will, presidential campaigning, because what the footage is, is many, many minutes of men all dressed alike, looking all alike, hot and sweaty in white shirts and black pants. And um, and it's it's really cheesy. And um, but the they they actually end up in fist fights on the floor of the convention as Taft people are trying to defend their guy Robert Taft from the onslaught of Eisenhower, and um, one of the reasons that Eisenhower manages to snatch the nomination from Taft in fifty two is that he is supported by Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. I mentioned Henry Cabot Lodge before Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. from Massachusetts, and um, that's going to play out in Massachusetts politics really obviously this is one of the ways we're going to get. Um, get JFK as a senator from Massachusetts later on, the anger in the state from what happened in the convention. But it's also going to give us the idea of Eastern liberals, the Eastern establishment that stands against the regular people. That comes straight out of 52 and, um, and the uh, association of Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. with the switch to Eisenhower in the 52 convention. Um, I'm sorry, there's so much great stuff here. Anyway, um, Eisenhower takes office and Eisenhower um, instantly is attacked by people in the Taft wing of the party as being uh, under the control of uh, socialists and communists. From the beginning, uh, a Republican, a very popular Republican president is being accused of being a communist. Immediately, Joe McCarthy ramps up his accusations of communism in the department, but he focuses obviously not uh, on bigger and bigger fish until, and he's actually supported by the, the Taft newspaper chains, like the Hearst Papers, for example. And he, um, 
he finally in 1954 overreaches himself and accuses the US Army of harboring communists. And with that, Eisenhower, who'd been trying to ignore him, uh, he can't ignore him any longer. And he's furious because Eisenhower cares really deeply about his army. Although he, at once he becomes a civilian president, he doesn't salute. You know, this whole business of presidents saluting, Eisenhower wouldn't salute. He wouldn't wear his uniform. He was known as Mr. President and not as a general because he felt it was really important to keep those lines very separate. Anyway, um, what happens with the uh, when he goes after the, the army is that the army, unlike other people, is not going to roll over and play dead for Joe McCarthy. So they counter sue and they and or counter accuse. And there, this the whole fight between the two is known as the Army McCarthy hearings, and it's televised in May of 1954. And when that happens, people really see these new uh, Taft Republican techniques on display. The things that sounded okay in print in the newspaper, accusations of communism and all that, look awful when you're seeing them on TV and you're actually seeing a U.S. senator, for example, making false accusations. At one point, they introduce into evidence a photograph that has obviously been doctored. And finally, in the end, um, um, uh, McCarthy punches down. It's a setup, by the way, but he punches down at one of the opposing counsel, Joseph Nye Welsh's aides, and accuses him of being a communist. And that's when Joseph Nye Welsh gives his very, very famous, and by the way, very well rehearsed statement, have you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you no sense of decency? And that really kind of breaks the fever of McCarthyism McCarthy's popularity plummets and he is uh, condemned by the Senate. He's not censured by the Senate, which is really important to McCarthy fans at the time, by the way, but he's condemned by the Senate. And he dies uh, within a couple of years from complications related to alcoholism. But what's interesting about him in this moment is it's really given a blueprint, a new kind of political blueprint for people to attack this de democratic ideal that has sprung up during uh, New Deal and I'm sorry, during the Depression and during World War II. Instead of saying to people, look, um, you know, here are the facts on the ground and here's why you shouldn't support this government you like so much, they're going to be creating a narrative that attacks and blusters and bullies and grabs headlines and can't be answered. And oh boy, should that sound familiar. That's exactly where this started. And by the way, it's worth noting that Joseph McCarthy's right-hand man, Roy Cohn, is the only person that Donald Trump has associated as one of his mentors. There is a direct line uh, here between McCarthy and the current president. That's not historical, but it's too cool. All right. Um, so um, on the heels of uh, the Army McCarthy hearings in, in 54, uh, William F. Buckley Jr. and his brother-in-law, L. Brent Bazell, write a book called McCarthy and His Enemies, in which they say, yeah, McCarthy might have had some rough edges, but he was right. And they divide the world in that book between uh, capital L liberals, by which they mean everybody in this liberal consensus. That's anybody who likes this New Deal government uh, the, and the Eisenhower government. He called it the middle way. Uh, that's Republicans, that's Democrats, that's basically almost all Americans, except themselves, except the Hoover people, Taft people who want to go back to the 1920s. And they call them capital L liberals to make them look as if they're some sort of organized cabal as opposed to a general drift. You know, these are Democrats and Republicans, but they label them all as capital L liberals. And they label themselves capital C conservatives, even though um, they're not conservative at all. They want to take an established government that seems to be helping a lot of people and that is very popular, and they want to um, to destroy it with a government based on an ideology. And that is exactly, exactly the definition of radicalism advanced by the person who really invented modern conservatism, Edmund Burke, after the French Revolution in America, uh, the, in, um, in, he, he's in, in England, they're in, in, um, in France, and he's the one who invents conservatism. They stand against this. But this is what historians have pointed to as the beginnings of modern day movement conservatism, conservatism, capital M, capital C, that says these are not real conservatives. Real conservatives stand for something very different. These are movement conservatives. They are a political organization. And that's in 54. All right. In 55, uh, in 54, while that's going on, of course, the Supreme Court 
is uh, unanimously under Republican Chief Justice deciding Brown v. Board of Education, in which they say that the government must create equality of opportunity for all, regardless of color. And on the heels of that in 1955, uh, William F. Buckley Jr. starts National Review, which vows to tell the violated businessman side of the story and to push back against government regulation and this newly active federal government. And he deliberately takes on both political parties that he says have been corrupted by fatuous slogans such as national unity, middle of the road, bipartisanship, and progressivism. Um, and this is, uh, of course, not at all a popular idea because people like that government. They like the government that has, for example, given them the GI Bill which has vaulted a number of people into the middle class who before World War II could never have afforded a, a, a college education. Um, we get, they, they also love the, the Federal Highway Act in 1956, um, which gives, uh, until this, this latest um, coronavirus bill was the largest, uh, uh, single largest public works program in American history. Uh, it gave us, of course, our federal highways. That's why they all say Eisenhower Highways. That was part of the 1956 Act, which has, of course, been expanded since then. And these new interstates pump all kinds of jobs into the economy because they're construction jobs, but they're also the hotel manufacturing, uh, manufacturing the, the diners, the gas stations, and more and more people have good paying jobs and are able to do like afford cars. So this is why we have the, all those gorgeous cars from the 1950s. Is People who were starving during the depression now can afford homes and they can have, they have jobs, steady jobs, they can afford well-paying jobs, they can afford homes, they can afford cars, uh, they can afford families. Of course, it's gonna be the baby boom and, and everything that their kids want, bicycles and, and things like that. Now it's not evenly spread throughout society, most Americans look at this system and they're like, we're not seeing a problem here, folks. And so they're not really willing to jump on board a system that um, people like William F. Buckley Jr. are saying is going to destroy America. Between 1945 and 1960, America's gross national product, its GNP, which is one of the ways to measure the economy, jumped 250% from $200 billion to $500 billion. And um, this not only helped the middle class, the, the vacuum effect, if you will, helped people in the bottom layers of society as well. So it was not at all clear to most Americans that this was a bad idea. So what were they gonna do? Um, they're they're gonna have to change the narrative and they're going to have to rely on, um, on, on the West to do this. And they're helped by the, the need to change the narrative by the fact that during World War II, as uh, historian Richard White has said, it's rather as if somebody took America and tipped it on its edge and poured everything west because of the fact that, um, that uh, planners were very concerned that there might be bombing in the East Coast, so you didn't really want to put manufacturing near established cities. And because the West was so underpopulated and uh, land was so cheap, most of the military installations and almost all of the new military uh, uh, in, uh, military uh, industries were established in the West. And what this means, of course, is people flood to the West in order to be working in the factories or be part of the military out there. And um, this meant that American money, the American uh, money from the US government contracting also pours into the West. So by, 19, um, by 1944, Los Angeles, which was not large at all before the war, rivals Detroit as the center of American manufacturing. Um, the, the money, as I say, um, uh, pours west during the war, but that continues after war uh, with the rise of the Cold War. So you have all these new industries out there that are dependent on federal money during the war. And after the war, we don't pull that back the way we did in every previous war. We continue to pour money into West Coast defense industries, especially in California. So California alone receives more than twice as much annual defense spending as any other state. In the 1950s, the Department of Defense put more than $50 billion into California. Um, Los, Los Angeles goes from 1.5 million residents in 1940 to more than 6 million people 20 years later. And for your baseball fans here, my partner always likes to point out that you can tell all this is happening because quite explicitly in 1957, the professional baseball um, 
uh, owners took note of the growth of the West and they moved one of the East's key rivalries. Uh, the Dodgers and the Giants went from New York City to and um, in Brooklyn to San Francisco to export that key rivalry to the American West. And then I always think it's a great way to remember it. So this worries people like Eisenhower desperately uh, and, and JFK after him, because he recognizes that we've got a problem in that um, there is increasingly a connection between the US government and this military complex. Uh, and he worries desperately about what he calls um, the military industrial complex and its effect on the country. But when Eisenhower first wrote that spe speech, he called the military industrial congressional complex because he was very concerned that Congress people would continue to pour West, pour money into these military installations, not only in the West, but also in the South and to some degree in the Northeast, but they're mostly in the West and the South because their constituents liked them. They were essentially a welfare program, but one that was wasting money. Eisenhower had no problem with welfare programs or work programs. He worried desperately about programs that he thought were essentially throwing away money. As he said, you know, every warship built means we're not building hospitals and schools. And that quotation that many of us knew from the Vietnam War, I always thought was a democratic uh, saying in the 1970s when I first learned it. No, 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 that's Eisenhower talking. That very famous speech uh, that he gives to the press corps after Stalin's death saying we must reset the Cold War. Anyway, um, this whole anti-communism, though, the, the federal money coming west to fight communism in the Cold War dovetails really nicely with what the movement conservatives are up to because they're anti-communist, right? So at the same time, you can say, I don't want any kind of domestic spending and certainly nothing that's going to help people of color and women because I'm anti-communist. So what you're saying is that I don't want my tax dollars going to people uh, to en enable them to have equal rights in housing or equal rights in education, people of color. But at the same time, you need to keep money flowing to me because I'm actually fighting for, for anti-communism. It's a real sleight of hand and, and one that is going to be deployed across uh, California. And it's going to be able to, um, to really solidify opposition to the increasing efforts of people on the East Coast, I'm sorry, people in the East to try and undercut the racism of the, the that has been existing in American society all along. So for example, as Truman tries to desegregate military, as Eisenhower follows up with Brown v. Board and with other things as well, there's this backlash um, among the black community, I'm sorry, among the white community and they do we get the sparking of the civil rights movement so for example in 1955 we get the murder of emmett till a 14 year old who's in the south to visit uh uh, a relative and is accused of whistling at a white woman. She later recanted her story, but is not only uh, not only killed in the lynching. He is uh, he is brutalized, and his mother says, uh, "I want people to see this." So she actually is an open casket for him, and it really horrifies not only the black community, um, uh, but but a lot of white people looking at this. But among the black community, of course, the murder of Emmett Till is a real spark for saying, "Come on, here, folks." You know, we just fought this war. We're American citizens. Let's get your acts together here. And on the heels of this, we get the um, the Montgomery bus boycott, and that's for the parks refusing to sit at the back of the bus. There's a much longer story there. I don't have time to go into it, but I want to emphasize that this is not about riding buses. It's partly about riding buses. It's about equal access. But one of the things that has been badly un overwritten in that story is... Um, has been uncovered by a phenomenal historian, Danielle McGuire. And that's that Rosa Parks was a longtime activist for women's rights because women were being sexually assaulted with no punishment for the perpetrators at all uh, in the South. And they finally had had enough. And they were standing up not simply so that they could get home from work, but so they could stop being sexually assaulted. Uh, she wrote a great book called On the Dark Side of the Street about that. And that's a great read too, by the way. There's also this backlash by, by 1956, um, 99 congressmen led by Strom Thurmond of South Carolina, who it turned out had later on had had a, a child with his, um, with his family's African-American mate when he was a kid. Anyway, they took a stand against Southern, uh, against uh, a government uh, enforced desegregation. They issued something called the Declaration of Constitutional Principles was known as the Southern Manifesto that said that desegregation was unconstitutional. 
And as you know, they stood against the desegregation of Little Rock High School, for example. Buckley's National Review picks this up and he makes segregation respectable, if you will. He instantly hires a, a guy named, instantly, in 55, he hires a Southern newspaper editor named James Kilpatrick to talk about how, in fact, desegregation is unconstitutional. And Buckley himself makes this argument in an, an article called Why the Self Must Prevail, in which he said, a minority should overrule a ma majority if the majority is wrong. And the majority that wants desegregation is wrong because white people are, quote, the advanced race and they should take matters into their own hands because otherwise they're going to be ruled by this, this um, inappropriate minority. And you should listen to that because that's going to come back to haunt us next week. Anyway, uh, this really takes off in the West. Um, it takes off um, in um, uh, among people who are working in the defense industries. And um, it they begin to talk about taxation and how taxation is a redistribution of wealth. And especially in the um, in this period, as they see this, uh, this government trying to protect equality of opportunity, they really go back to the years of Reconstruction saying taxes to promote equality of opportunity are a redistribution of wealth. They are communism, which we stand against, even though we're earning all this federal money. And they really hearken back to old Western tropes like those cowboys. And this is in the 1950s when you get all those Westerns on TV. And they're showing now on these newfangled televisions. And you have, uh, for example, Gunsmoke, Rawhide, Bonanza, Wagon Train, Lone Ranger. By 1959, there are 26 Westerns on TV. Um, and in March of 1958, eight of the, the week's top shows were Westerns. And all these, they're very, the old storyline. Cowboys are white and they're, 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 they're women folk. And they're putting, they're not, they're taking, they're putting, they're fighting for civilization without the help of the government. And this, of course, is what Baxby Goldwater, who positions himself as a cowboy, even though he's from a wealthy family, um, has, you know, maids, chauffeurs, the whole thing. He talks increasingly about, you know, he's from this old stock. They don't want anything from the government, even though, um, even though he uh, is, is uh, not, you know, he, even though he himself is benefiting hugely from, uh, from government money being poured into his home state of Arizona. That's what makes his family's fortune. Um, but he runs, they, his people want him to run for president in 1960. And so he goes, to, actually he, it's under his name, but L. Brent Bazell uh, ghost writes his book called Conscience of a Conservative in which he basically says, you know, we must get back to this government that um, that William F. Buckley, L. Brent Bazell's brother-in-law, wrote about in 1951. We need to get away from what he calls an activist government. And what they say is the, wor the world really works better if a few elite people run it. And the government trying to intervene in these social matters like Brown v. Board is unconstitutional and it destroy American society. And in, um, of course, he, he gets passed over in 1960. And when Richard Nixon win, uh, loses to, uh, to John F. Kennedy, Republicans in the Taft mold simply say, well, see, there you go. You know, we need to have somebody who takes a strong hand, not some weakling like uh, like um, like Nixon, and we need to take a stronger stand in favor of what we believe. So in 1964, they do manage to get Goldwater on the ticket, and in Goldwater's um, in Goldwater's uh, convention. You know, African Americans had been voting for the Republican Party, and Jackie Robinson, the baseball player, actually goes. He's always gone. He's a Republican, and he's horrified when he leaves the Goldwater Convention because people have been spitting on him. Uh, they set an African American uh, 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 delegate on fire, his coat on fire, and uh, Jackie Robinson goes out and he later says, "Now I know how it feels to be a how how it quote how it felt to be Jew." in Hitler's Germany. I mean, it's a real change here for the Republican Party to grab hold of this movement conservatism as opposed to the liberal consensus that it had had under Eisenhower and that Nixon tried to bring on. Well, Eisenhower crashes and burns, but something important happens, and that is that he gets 
uh, not only is home state of Arizona, but the five states of the Deep South. They love this idea that uh, any kind of attempt to create equality between African Americans and white Americans is unconstitutional. And this is the beginning of the Republican Party switch from, I'm sorry, the, the uh, Southern Democrats switch and the, Democrat, the Republican Party switch from being the party of equality and not with opportunity after World War II to picking up those Dixiecrats and becoming the party of segregation, which is what's gonna happen over the next several years. All right, um, so, um, what, so Goldman crashes and burns, but his ideology, uh, what he does is he turns this movement concern ideology from something that belongs to a few elites into a much more popular, simple narrative. And this starts during his campaign with Phyllis Schlafly, that's that documentary about her now, with Phyllis, or, or whatever it is, biopic. Um, uh, she uh, says, you know, I'm really tired of hearing about how um, Goldwater's ideas are too simple. You know, that these elite eggheads say you have to have complicated answers to the way the world works. In fact, it is very simple. It is black and white. There's good and there's evil and he's for good and we need to be him. He's a choice. He's not an echo of this, this complicated stuff that the Democrats and the traditional Republicans talk about. He's simple and he is a choice, not an echo. And she increasingly insists that common people understand people like Goldwater because he understands principle. He cuts through the crap, the complicated world that Eisenhower had talked about and instead says, yeah, I'm going to kill the commies or I'm going to go ahead and take a stand against them. And she begins to turn this idea into a very simple idea. And Ronald Reagan, who had, was an actor who had turned to a political career uh, after he started hosting General Electric's weekly television show that promoted free enterprise, um, he owned the same thing. He comes on to TV to support Goldwater in 1964 with a very simple hour long, uh, I think it's hour, maybe a half hour presentation called um, A Time I'm Choosing. And in that he says, you know, we, he gives a very simple story about how America is at this moment of choosing between the individual and the ant heap of totalitarianism. That this New Deal uh, activist government that Americans like so much and it's, that's creating such prosperity is in fact a slippery slope on the way to communism. And for his part, he doesn't believe that these eggheads in Washington, and he takes a pot shot at Harvard here, um, that they have any, because Eisenhower and, and, um, and Kennedy, of course, is, are associated with uh, academics and Kennedy with Harvard. Um, that they should plan your life. He said, I have faith that you and I can plan our lives better than anybody off in some far off capital. And they are crushing individualism. And he says, we must take a stand on this idea of protecting individualism. And of course, by that, he means that he doesn't want the government to, um, to protect equality of opportunity and to take tax dollars to do that for people on uh, people on the margins. Um, so, um, uh, this idea, this simple idea manages to stand in the 1960s and the 1970s against the rising uh, liberation movements of people who are demanding an equal say in American society. And of course, it's going to include African Americans who are going to be powerful in the 1960s. It's going to include uh, Mexican Americans uh, who are terribly understudied among, at least among um, you know, the general population during the liberation movements, because theirs is one of the first when Dr. Hector Garcia, after World War II, starts the American GI Forum, where he starts to say, wait a minute, shouldn't we be voting over here? And you said Braceros are going to be protected. And in fact, they're not. They're not getting paid and the women are getting raped in the fields. Let's go ahead and, uh, and get some power here for Mexican Americans. And of course, of course, we also have in the 1960s the women's movement, where women start to insist on having um, equal rights to their male counterparts, not as wives and mothers, but as equal members of American society. And that is um, is uh, really accepted doctrine among the Republican Party as well as among the Democratic Party during the 1960s. It's going to change, of course. And then we also have really dramatically in the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, the American Indian Movement. And the American Indian Movement is a really powerful uh, critique of the way the American government has worked against people of color during, their, uh, during its entire history. So just as Congress is beginning to grapple with this, um, these, these movements are getting stronger and stronger and people are saying, you know, you're not really doing enough yet. 
not really included in American society. And unfortunately, just as Congress expands democracy in the South with the passage of the Voting Rights Act in the mid 60s, riots break out in Northern cities among the African American population because of um, the economics of the post-war years. But what that does is that show, it, it basically convinces reactionary white Americans that, uh, that minorities want more than their, you know, here's Congress finally guaranteeing your right to vote and you're rioting. What more do you want? It's a really unfortunate coincidence there. Um, this means that uh, it enables the reactionaries, the people in the Goldwater camp to say, we told you, we told you that your tax dollars were being redistributed to these ungrateful people. And um, in uh, this, this plays out, this idea plays out through the 1960s and through the 1970s. And it plays out really dramatically in the 1970s because of the inflation of the 1970s, which I really don't have time to go into now, takes a lot of white Americans who, um, who are hurting in, in some of the contractions in the 70s, the, uh, the, uh, the oil crisis after the um, Arab-Israeli war, and some of the crises that are, that are creating stagflation in America. And the inflation of those years pushes white Americans into higher income tax brackets solely by virtue of inflation, not by virtue of the fact they're making more money, pushes them into higher tax brackets so they're paying more in taxes right at the same time that uh, they have less money because of this crap, because of these economic economic crises. So they're particularly susceptible to the idea that their tax dollars are being wasted, especially on minority populations that to them look like they are dangerous, like they are rioting in the streets, like they are not contributing to American society. And there's a, a wonderful moment, and I'm, I'm going to end here because I always promise you to stay at, at an, an hour. I'm already a minute over. There, but there is that wonderful moment. This is why Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock becomes so important. When a man who is um, an African American slash Native American plays the Star Spangled Banner the way he does, if you are a, a white veteran, if you're Archie Bunker, if you will, and you hear this, it just seems like your entire world has been ripped apart. And that's sort of the way things look as the, um, as the 70s progress, but, but as this happens, movement conservatives increasingly hammer on this idea that, um, that the, the tax dollars are going from hardworking white people to lazy people of color. And after Nixon gets into such trouble in 1970 after the Kent State shooting, when he loses his support among middle class Americans, he very deliberately divides the country in half. He says, There's two of us, and I want to, I mean, I believe my half is bigger. And he creates them, those people who want your tax dollars, they don't want to work, and they want to have wealth redistributed to them. And those people should not have say in American society. That really takes off. And, um, and that concept, that narrative, that simple narrative, the idea that individualism is being crushed by um, this attempt to redistribute wealth to the undeserving really hits to me uh, uh, a peak and a really central moment in 1977 with the creation of the movie Star Wars. Because if you think about Star Wars, it is that classic story of the individual against the empire. And it is a brilliant movie, of course, and it speaks to all kinds of, of mythology, world mythology, as well as American mythology. But it gives structure and, and color and power, emo emotional power to this idea of the individual who is being destroyed, his hopes and his dreams for an education, which is what Luke wants, and for his, his uncle wants, just wants the crops to be okay. It's being crushed by this empire. And that really helps to articulate what the movement conservatives have been saying. They finally need their, uh, their real power in uh, the election 1980, of course, with the rise of Ronald Reagan, who announces his candidacy in in uh, in Mississippi, right near where civil rights workers have been um, have been assassinated during the civil rights era, and he makes it a big point to talk about in that speech. He says, "I believe in states' rights." I mean, we're going back here to an earlier era. I, he talks about getting rid of taxes. He talks about getting rid of government regulation, and he promises to restore America 
to this great land that it once was. He actually talks about making America great again. He is, of course, elected in 1980. And in his inaugural address, which is on the western side of the, portico, of the, of the western portico of the White House for the first time, that's actually um, um, chance. Uh, but it is really very symbolic because, of course, he is writing from that part of, I mean, he's, he is representing that part of California that has grown very, very fat on government contracts, but at the same time stands against communism uh, and doesn't see any kind of a disconnect there. So the movement to the West, uh, people saw as symbolic. He stands out there and he he has risen to power on the idea of the welfare queen, this woman who is on the system dry. And she, he never says she's black, but he says she's from the South side of Chicago, and he portrays her as typical of uh, an American woman, African American woman, who doesn't want to um, to work hard, who's basically sucking the system dry. And he's risen on that image, and he talks about the individual, and he he talks about how people have to get their lives back. And he stands out there on the western portico, and he talks about how he is going to speak up for real Americans. He was going to speak for one special interest, it was he calls minority, uh, minority interests and women's interests. He's going to stand for only one uh, special interest, and that's the American taxpayer, the American people, you know, as he says, the forgotten man. And he says at the heart of his speech, he says, people are always keep looking to um, to the government for solutions, but the government is not the solution. Government is the problem. And in 1981, when he takes office, we're going to see an entirely new phase of America, an entirely new phase of American government, which is the process of unraveling that New Deal consensus, that liberal consensus that the New Deal and World War II had put into place that reassertion of American democracy. We're going to see the start of that unraveling in 1981. And today, all these years later, we're seeing the outcome of that. I'm sorry to have run over. Uh, as I say, each week is my favorite material. If you are interested in this, um, I talk a lot about this material in a lot of places. But today, I have been loosely following along uh, with my new, uh, my new um, book, uh, How the South Won the Civil War, Oligarchy, Democracy, and the Continuing Fight for the Soul of America. And I will finish that next week. Um, I, I say I'll finish it, but it may be if you're interested, I will do a final week on the writing of the book and the research of the book if people are interested in that. If you're not, it's fine. Um, but uh, I will be back to finish that prod particular project next week. I thank you for being here. Finally, one last time, my name is Heather Cox Richardson, and when I do these talks, I am not speaking for my employer. I'm solely speaking for myself and trying to enter entertain you people while we're all stuck at home during a pandemic. Anyway, thanks a lot for coming along, and I will see you next week.